Uh, thanks for coming. It's a great pleasure to be in the coaching seminar. That I... Now it's on? Yes. Yeah. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be in the coaching seminar. <laughs> uh, I've never been here and I've always admired work of coaching and his many disciples uh, in differential uh, algebra. Unfortunately, this talk is not exactly differential algebra, although time permitting, uh, at the end, maybe I mention something in differential algebra. The main point of this talk is a certain answer that justified my pet love, experimental mathematics. Right now, I'm reading a fascinating book by a German young physicist called Sabine Hossenfeld, I think. It's called Lost in Mess, which I strongly recommend. <laughs> it's how mathematics ruined theoretical physics. <laughs> so physics is really a little latecomer in being ruined by mathematics. What happens that most of theoretical physics today is no longer science. It just is a mess and of speculations. The energies that makes it possible to test the theories will never be achieved, even if the taxpayer will spend billions and billions more, even if nobody will get any uh, things, uh, if the government will spend all this money on the colliders and not care about uh, garbage and anything else, even then it's not testable. So it's not testable in principle. By the way, remind me your name. Uh, William Sitt. Yes, yeah, hi. We, we, we have a man for a long time. Isaac. I mean, uh, Icar. Yeah. I have a famous uh, uh, Sitt theorem about <laughs> converting uh, theorems into. It's coffee. a I coffee. Coffee, coffee right. to theorem. Elder said that. Elder said that mathematician <laughs> is a device for converting coffee into theorems. <laughs> and William Sitt has some variation on this. Right. <laughs> anyway. It was a pleasant to be here. Thanks. Anyway, lost in mess. Thanks for the reading. Yeah. So this unfortunate situation that <laughs> physics got ruined by mess happened. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, you came late. Is that you left the light? No. Yeah. Oh, sorry. You didn't hear that. Absolutely no I, cell phones. I'm yeah. I'm shutting it off. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So this unfortunate situation uh, that mess ruined, uh, or rather rigorous mess ruined. Uh, physics happened 2300 years ago with somebody called Plato and Euclid. And they started the deductive method in mathematics. Until Euclid and Plato and the friends in ancient China, in ancient Babylon, in ancient Sumer, in India, and also in Greece, I guess. Math was a science, experimental science. You did experiments and you verified them and they had a scientific method. You had a conjecture, you refuted them and then came Euclid and ruined mathematics for the next 2300 years. So an example of an experimental mathematics, let me give you the first warm up. Not terribly deep theorem, but nevertheless a good theorem. Fact. Six is a Fibonacci number. Proof, experimental proof. The location of this room, uh, even with I, I pointed out the exact location, uh, I had some <laughs> trouble getting here. That's why I was one minute late. I was here 10 minutes early, but then I was there through the maze. It was not trivial to find. Uh, and, and Claire didn't actually tell me that I have to uh, exactly the algorithm. <laughs> anyway, uh, proof. The location here is room 5, 3, 8, 2. <laughs> and the address is 365, 365, fifth. Avenue and the zip code is 10016. Zero, zero, zero is the Fibonacci number, one is the Fibonacci number, two is the Fibonacci number, three is the Fibonacci number, five is the Fibonacci number, eight. So six is the exception that proves the rule, hence six is the Fibonacci number. 
And if it's not, it should be. <laughs> so end of the first theorem. A slightly deeper theorem is the following fact, or fact. Let zeta of s be defined as follows. Sigma n goes from 1 to infinity, 1 over n to the power s, and when the real part of s is larger than 1, then obviously it converges into a nice analytic function, and it's a little exercise left to the reader that I guess Euler already did, or definitely Riemann, but it's really an exercise. It can be easily extended analytically to the real part of S is bigger than zero. So this is a nice, of course, if you extend it all the way to the complex plane, it has some poles, trivial poles, but you don't have to worry about it if all you care about is the right hand side. Define the following sequence of complex numbers. Let Z sub n be the nth in absolute value, in absolute value, and complex number such that Zeta of Zn equals zero. So we're defining an infinite sequence of complex numbers. A priori, it could be anything. Uh, it's easy to see that uh, it's a discrete, discrete set, but it's, uh, uh, it's even not so easy, but it has been proved that it's an infinite set. Uh, there are many, infinitely many of these. So here we have a fact. For every n bigger or equal to 1, the real part of the n equals 1 half. So this is a fact. A few days ago, a proof was announced. Proof due to an obscure British mathematician who, I don't know, somehow became a knight, but uh, I don't know how, very obscure. Sir Michael Atia. And he posted a five page proof in the internet. Some details are still missing, but it's posted. So Sir Michael Atia. It's amazing, and he's not so young anymore. He's obscure, but not as young. Uh, born in uh, 1929. So I have to admit I didn't quite uh, follow all the details, but the sketch is extremely simple. So let me quote uh, from his beautiful, the first thing. The full details are contained in blah, blah, blah. The techniques developed in blah, blah, blah are a novel fusion of ideas of von Neumann and Hirzebruch. They are sophisticated and powerful, based on an infinite iteration of exponentials while having an inherent simplicity. So hopefully it's a proof from the book. So whether all the details have been checked, it's still an open problem. But I already knew this fact. I'm not surprised that it's true. Now that we know for sure that it's true, they put a formal proof using all, and how can a field medalist and Abel Price winner be wrong? So obviously it's a true proof, even though I confess a, a valid proof, even though I confess I don't follow all the details. I already have a proof before. <laughs> but since people, as, uh, since I'm not as famous as I was embarrassed, <laughs> obviously. But now that I know for sure that there is a proper proof of the Riemann hypothesis, let me state my own 
Poof. It's due to a lemma. Due to a disco. And the real thing from the 80s. Yeah. And of course, not last, last but not least, the computers. And the computer. Real part of the end. Equals to one half for every n between one and I don't know. Now it keeps getting big, probably up to ten billion. So it has been set rigorously up to this. So corollary. Since both sides of this. Identity are true, and you don't need 10 billion. That's a big, big waste of computer time. So I suspect maybe for ends, it's also already very, very conservative. Unfortunately, I still don't have a detail. <laughs> Belong to the so called Zyberger ansatz. And the Zalberger answer says, so for every identity for which this obviously belongs to, and this obviously belongs to, constant always belong to it, there exists an a priori number n zero. They can find, can be found computationally, such that if n is less than or equal to n zero, then it's true for every. So these are called the N0 principles. The only missing part, and maybe I leave it as exercise to the reader, is to actually define the Zalberger ansatz and prove and find explicitly N0. So like Sir Michael Atia, it's only a sketch. <laughs> so, but so, if it's not so enough... For, for mon a false mathematical induction, N0 could be zero. Oh, yeah. <laughs> would that be still, would your answer be Oh, and zero, yeah, if it's a constant, uh, like the, the speed of light is always, uh, it's almost 300,000, is if you check it one time. Uh, and since by the constant, if you check it once, okay. Right. And zero could be zero if it's a constant. If the constant answers. But the constant answers, oh, wow. if you know that something is a constant a priori, <laughs> if you check it in one point. <laughs> For example, uh, 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 you don't have to, to prove that Trump is an idiot. You don't have to give 1,000 cases. It's enough to have one case uh, and then it's to prove that Trump is an idiot. Because when somebody says Trump is idiotic, he's always an idiot. Okay, that's an example. <laughs> okay. Anyway, going back to this. Unfortunately, there's still three missing gaps. But the other answer says, for which the analogous statement is perfectly true. And many people are unaware of it and still publish papers that are utterly trivial. That obviously, if you check it for finally many cases, it's true. For example, <laughs> nobody will publish the proof 2 plus 3 equals 5. In the old days, 20,000 years ago, this was a very deep statement. Very, very abstract statement. It means that two bears plus three bears equals five bears. Uh, two elephants plus three elephants equals five elephants. Then people define the very abstract notion of cardinal number, and then it became to us a triviality. So today, you cannot publish the paper and you prove <laughs> of two plus three equals five, it will probably be rejected, even by the Fabulasic quarterly, and definitely by the Annals of Mathematics. <laughs> but 20,000 years ago, the Annals of Mathematics would have gladly accepted it. It would have been a very deep result. And one way of proving it is saying by isomorphism, it's enough to pick up two examples, you two, <laughs> two, you three, and then count. Two, three, four, five. So why not check it in one case by, <laughs> by later mathematics? It's enough to check it then. And then have people, little kids, 
uh, do addition in fingers. One, two, uh, two, and three, five. <laughs> and how do you know it's valid? And this is finger, but my toes, well, what about candy bars? <laughs> Let me know, this thing. So that's an example of the numerical answers. But this is today trivial because it's specific numbers. You don't have symbol. Okay, this is not so trivial. Because it has a symbol. This is a priori true for infinitely many cases. And to prove something for infinitely many cases, it's not enough to uh, check a few cases. And for this, there are certain cautionary tales. The purest, old God purist who don't respect experimental mathematics, who think that everything has to be proven rigorously, always like to quote as proving that they cannot trust. And another great mathematician that is not not a sir, he's not a knight, even though he's British, but he should have been a knight that I admire even more than Sir Michael Idea. So if I was a queen, I would give him, I call him Sir Richard Guy. And he was, in two days, he was born September, not today, in two more days, 1916, he'll be 102 years old, and still going strong. So not only is he alive as a, as a person, as a, as a human, or as a like mathematician, in the sense of editors, he still publishes and active and goes to conferences, and I saw it in the last JMM, uh, and I hope to see him in the one in Baltimore. Uh, I actually he heard he was going to stop going to conferences. Oh, oh he did? Uh, that's what I heard. This oh, too bad. I, so I cannot see him. I won't see him next month. Well, I can't swear to it, but I spent... Oh, too bad. I okay. spent my summers in Calgary, and he oh, okay. he said he wasn't. By the way, what's your name? Churchill. Oh yeah, I know. Okay, okay. Uh, too bad. Okay, so until last time, uh, until last day, mm -hmm. in San Diego, I think it was. Uh, he showed up. And anyway, he had a famous paper in the American American Monthly called the Strong Law of Large Numbers. And this contains like about 25 or maybe more, and then you have a sequel. The sequel was in mass magazines about 35 or 40 years ago. It's a classic. You can easily nowadays look it up in the internet or in Day Store. I'm sure you have Day Store. So go to Day Store and look for Strong Law. I strongly recommend it. It's classic. And he has like about 25 or maybe more cautionary tales of sequences that start out the same, and then after 20 terms, usually 10 terms, but sometimes even 15 terms, deviate. In other words, you cannot jump the conclusion, say the purist. And uh, there's a joke about it, uh, of the very naive way of using it. Uh, it's a famous joke, as uh, so I'm sure you heard before, but for the sake of completeness, uh, let me give you it. It's a mathematician, a physicist, an engineer, and Terabar. And first, a mathematician says, yeah, but it's not really a rigorous mathematician. It's an experimental mathematician. He said, one is a prime, it is not exactly a colloquially the prime. Three is a prime, five is a prime, seven is a prime, hence every odd integer is a prime. Then the physicist, it's a physics law, and the physicists look good. <laughs> one is a prime, three is a prime, of course, one in colloquially is a prime, but of course, one is a prime, one is a prime three is a prime, five is a prime, seven is a prime, nine, it's an experimental error. <laughs> seven is a prime, seven is a prime, hence every integer is a prime. And then the engineer is thinking very, very hard uh, for half an hour and pondering it. And says, I got it! One is a prime, three is a prime, five is a prime, seven is a prime, nine is a prime, and have it an insane. And anyway, the point is, with prime numbers, uh, this is not enough. But about two years ago, Neil Sloan and my beloved servant, Salos Biachad, and myself posted a paper with much, many more cautionary tales. So the best defense is attack. Try to anticipate your enemy. So we found lots of fuel for the purest thing. 
So, well, Rita Guy only came up with example, I think, most of them were only nine terms, and then they deviated. We came up with Ben Mill. But before, he's not the first one to warn people against the jump into conclusions. Another hero of mine, Charles Babbage, the inventor of the computer that we all have to be thankful for. But unfortunately, most of my students who use the laptop never heard of him. And even probably some of my colleagues never heard of him, which is a shame. People are really ungrateful. And so, but anyway, uh, Babbage wrote a nice paper in 1820. Also, I recommend you can easily get it uh, in the internet on induction. Somebody, uh, uh, somebody, I forgot his name, but very nicely transcribed it in modern uh, with, with commentary on induction. And then he recalled some famous instances of the law of, of, of Richard Guy, law of small number. So Richard Guy popularized it and gave many good examples. But before the already existed examples, and Babbage was a precursor of Richard Guy. So of course we all know how Fermat Fermat was usually very reliable, but he famously made a two mistake, probably announcing a proof of Fermat's theorem that he probably didn't have, but also he didn't prove it, he, he didn't claim it, but he made a conjecture that 2 to the power 2 to the n plus 1 is also the prime for every n. And indeed, he didn't have a calculator, <laughs> so, <laughs> so he left it by hand. And so on. And don't tell me. Five, uh, five right? Mm -hmm. To the, uh, to the power four plus one seventeen. Yeah, so look, my see. To the power. That is, I can see the by hand easily. Uh, Two fifty seven. To the power four plus one. Eight five. Nine nine by hand. Come on. One, don't tell me, uh, one, two, three, four, four, two, three, four, two, four, one, six, six, three, five, six, five, six, five, six, five, six, five, six. Yeah, easily, uh, you can bet. Uh, exercise, check this prime. So check all the prime numbers up to the square root of this and divide and, and see this the prime. And that's what probably Farmer did. But he was too impatient to take this one. <laughs> and it's at the conclusion from uh, four, uh, five, I don't know, five special cases. And it took the genius of Euler uh, to prove that it's not a prime. In hindsight, Fermat could have done it when it's one rainy afternoon. <laughs> he just do a mod. So he tried mod, blah, blah, blah. So every day, I even for, you can just say, every Sunday for the next year, uh, I will do. So mod three, mod five, look at all the prime numbers, uh, and that's very easy to do modular exponentiation. So he could have done it if he were patient. Uh, of course, it's hindsight. They know there'd be such a small prime. So that's not fair to criticize them. Anyway, Euler did it. I don't know how he did it. Maybe he had a smart way of doing it. Okay, so Euler did it. But even Euler, the great Euler, was fooled by by the law of small numbers. And another thing not as well known is the following things, but Euler and Akfirma found his own mistakes. He corrected it immediately. He was amazing. So he was really reliable. So he based, so let remember the 2n to the n is the coefficient of x to the power 0 in 1 plus x, oh, so 1 plus x, okay. so that's to the power n. That's one way of defining the central binomial coefficient. But the trinomial coefficient is the coefficient of x to the power n in 1 plus x plus x squared to the power n. Okay, that's better. 1 plus x, yeah, okay. 
Then they have to turn coefficients. So I will have studied it. And empirically, he found out the following amazing coincidence. That... If you take the central trinomial coefficient, so we define by n. Let's define an. So let the central, let's define it. Everything here will be like in the OIS. The generic sequence will be a of n. I prefer a of n to a sub n. a sub n is a remnant of the old days. Remember in the old days, there were no professors uh, who were women, oh, minorities. <laughs> Everybody was a white man. Uh, and uh, and uh, even before that, everybody was a white uh, Christian man. But luckily, now things have changed. But also, in mathematics, in the old days, continuous mathematics was the predominant culture. And a function with a continuous argument was f of x. But if the function happened to be a discrete argument, derogatorily, they made it a subscript in the small things. This is very, very unfair to the discrete world. But now that we have discrete liberation movement, we can, and I'm very happy that OIS, also for typesetting reasons, it's easier to write a of n than uh, a. I mean, in tech, it's easy enough, but in general, anyway, so it's anyway. anyway, so Euler, the great Euler, experimented and found the following amazing coincidence. Three times a of n plus one minus a of n plus two. Surprise, surprise, back to the Fibonacci numbers. <laughs> it's a product of two consecutive Fibonacci numbers. An exercise for you, check it, it's true for eight, or maybe nine values, yeah. Yeah, for nine values. From minus one to seven. But then Euler, uh, being very, very reliable, very, very conscientious, before making it as a conjecture, we checked A8, <laughs> and it's wrong. <laughs> so here's something, that was true for eight different values, but failed in general. And all of fun is on this day. But he, he thought it was amusing enough to write it up. So he described how he was almost, was fooled to making a conjecture, and then he, without a computer, that's my hand, and he did all by himself. So Euler is one of my heroes. Another thing by my hero, he was not such a stickler for ego. Later on, Cauchy and Weierstrass also ruined mathematics even more by <laughs> insisting on the analysis, epsilon and delta. So for Euler, every series converges and one minus one plus one minus one plus one minus one, so that equals one half. Make perfect sense and I like him for so that. And in hindsight, most of the things that Euler and his contemporaries did using power series, now, Cauchy and Weierstrass, and even today, some people seeing as non-rigorous, so they call it a formal proof, can be made absolutely rigorous with the so-called formal power series approach, which is more rigorous than analysis, because formal power series is part of discrete mass. So, fundamentally and philosophically, it's more rigorous. Unfortunately, in physics, in mass, when people say formal proof, uh, now formal proof also has another super rigorous proof uh, meaning, so it's really ambiguous. In the old days in physics, formal proof means not really a proof, a heuristic proof, a hand waving, uh, using this. And, and in, in logic, and especially computerized logic, formal proof is an iron tight proof that you cannot trust even human humans. Like the four color theorem now, but yet all a uh, formal proof. And has spent 15 years making his uh, proof into a formal proof. Uh, so, to cast any doubt, I think it was the biggest waste of 
Tom Ellis one of my heroes time by just stupid referees of the Reinhardt that they had a disclaimer that he had been checked, so he did it. So no, it was nice exercise in programming, but I had no doubt that this proof was true, even without the so-called formal proof. Anyway, this is the, the question. So anyway, uh, in combinatorics and number theory, many proofs using Euler style power theories can be made completely rigorous by the notion of formal power. Uh, formal power series and the algebra of formal power series. Okay, so this is the introduction about experimental mathematics. So uh, two years ago, uh, Neil Sloan and I, and with collaboration with my beloved collaborator, and used to be servant, but now it becoming my master. I love you, Yechad found many more cautionary tests. There's an interesting type of sequences in number theory called piso sequences. It's really a very nice sequence. So the piso sequence has two parameters. It's usually denoted by E of x, y. So you define a sequence by a recurrence. Once again, a recurrence. This is a recurrence. Uh, by so in this condition, a of zero is x, a of one of it, a of one is y. So you have many, many, many such sequences. You can cook up for any initial conditions. And then a of n is a of n minus one square over a of n minus 2 plus 1 half. These variations, they change 1 half to something else, but let's stick to 1 half. It's the most interesting case. So it's very easy on a computer to crank out the first 10,000 terms or even more. So let's quote one special case. In the OIS, so it was in the OIS, uh, the following. So, uh, yeah. So, yeah. So the Pizot sequence E of 4, 7. So A of 0 is 4, A of 1 is 7. So A of 2, let's compute A of 2, is 4 square. Sorry, and 7 square. Over 4. Plus one half is what? Okay, don't tell me. 49 over 4 plus one half integer part. Common denominator. Okay, 98. Okay, 102 over 8. Oh, it's exactly. So, so 32? No, no, no. No, 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 no. 22, 22. So it's 22. So, uh, so, uh, so is it not? Two, 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 two. Six. Yeah, you made the six. Right. So it is right. And then you can compute a few more terms. And somebody computed it for 50, some hacker or Actually, I'm, I'm not so much magician. Computed this sequence for 50,000 terms. And made the following conjecture. That this sequence defined by this non-linear recurrence. Surprise, surprise. Satisfies a very simple Fibonacci-like linear recurrence. Namely, the following recurrence. A of n equals twice a of n minus 1 minus a of n minus 2 for the third order recurrence. Plus a of n minus 3. For 50,000 cases, can you deduce this true for every n up to infinity? Yes, you can. And if you did it, you would be correct. It is indeed true for every n. 
but just checking it for 50,000 cases, in this case, would have been the wrong proof. And somebody called Alexei, uh, Alexei, Max Alexei, uh, proved it rigorously. Not hard, it's, in hindsight, it's really an exercise. Uh, you use a Binet style formula for this, and you prove that, so you define this by P of N in the conditions, and then uh, you plug it in. Uh, it's not hard, it, it, it's not trivial, but it's not hard. So in this case, this prediction was justified. But already Boyd, I think even in the uh, mid-60s, uh, found a episode sequence that has a nice recurrence. Where is it? Uh, up to... Let me get the relevant table. Sorry, two minutes, please. Country, two people uh, from, uh, I think, from Caltech or UCLA, I forgot, uh, did uh, found, uh, found examples. Anyway, let, let me tell you my uh, the example that Klaus Bierhardt found, uh, where you had Yeah, here it goes. The, so the following piece of sequence. So that's much more ammunition to the uh, critique of experimental mathematics that you cannot jump to conclusions. So this piece of sequence 30, 989, that later became, became the OIS uh, sequence. Uh, uh, I don't know, it's an OIS. Uh, in this case, it satisfies the following recurrence. Fourth order of A of n equals 23, never mind exactly. Some fourth order recurrence, blah, blah, blah. Minus 11. So some specific, very simple, for a fourth order recurrence. And not, it's true up to 15,889. <laughs> but once you plug in, uh, 1500, 890, it's false. <laughs> so this is great ammunition for this. That will mean we cannot trust uh, my proof of the Riemann hypothesis at the beginning. <laughs> of course you can, because it's a good explanation why this argument, even though sometimes it seems to work, by, by luck, uh, is not valid. Because we have an identity, A of N equals B of N. A of N is the sequence defined by the Pizzo rule, which is a non-linear recurrence, and B of N is defined by a simple linear recurrence. So we have an identity, and you're seeing with an identity, everything is fine. <laughs> and indeed, that's what the culprit is, this Bay of Noxus, Integer value sign. Which I hate! Because <laughs> this is that we say that x equals an integer m is a shorthand for the statement that x minus m is between 0 and 1. <laughs> and this is an inequality! Yeah. This is an inequality in disguise. So the Pizzo thinks that it's really an inequality in disguise. And it's very easy to copy examples uh, debunking the uh, experimental mess with inequalities. <laughs> Here's one example. What's your favorite? A big number. Okay, so theorem. N is uh, divided by Google. Uh, is less than one for every n. Take the computer and check it from one to all this, and it's true. So my job is true. 
So you cannot, in the quality of this empirical thing, does not apply to in quality. So in this case, it's obvious because it's explicitly. <laughs> but we disguise in terms of this obnoxious uh, flow functions, uh, in the Japan function, uh, this is. So this. So sometimes you can trust it, sometimes you can not. In fact, speaking of inequalities, the same with this call, another digression. In uh, the early 1980s, this proved a conjecture of Mertens. The Riemann hypothesis is famously equivalent to the following statement about the partial sum of the so called Mobius functions, which I'm probably everybody knows here. And I'm so it says there exists a constancy. So for every epsilon bigger than zero, there exists a constant that may depend on epsilon, but not on n. So this is an equivalent statement of the Riemann hypothesis. But Mertens, that was a very great number theorist, empirically, without a computer, accepted and made a stronger conjecture. And using a computer, a disco, and I think the real, uh, in the 80s, early 80s, this proved it. They went far enough. But it is not. But mu eyes are injurious, right? Yeah, by point, yeah. There's either one negative one or zero. Yeah, so, but the, the right hand side. Uh, ah, because it could be negative. Oh, absolutely. Sorry. Thank you. The inequality. Yeah, yeah but, 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 but then this would just mean that starting from some n. It is just always. Oh, sorry, 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 no. Uh, it's, I had it wrong. It's, uh, maybe enter the bar? No, it's. Uh, yeah. <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Of course, of course. Uh, and the statement was this. Yeah, yeah the, the, the prime number theorem is the here then. So. Of. Uh, yeah, you know, of one. This is. Yeah, 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 so this is the idea of n. The Panama theorem that Shelberg and Elders famously gave an elementary proof for is equivalent to this one. But even, oh, maybe this won't get you a million dollars. <laughs> even this is wide open. Anyway, so, yeah, so, a Mertens conjecture uh, that this. And uh, it's false morning. And this turned to be false. I think it's still open, but probably false. So it's for, for bigger constant, it's still open. It's fine, I don't know. Anyway, so that's, so that's also an inequality in this case, but I think it's still, with the Riemann, with the original statement, it's very reliable. Anyway, let me go to the point of time chunk. Before going to the main talk, Main topic of the talk that I may run out of time, because another principle of me is not to go more than an hour, so I have to start going faster, is a polynomial ansatz. So, theorem that is well known to Pythagoras, but very possibly so many people before him or in him. Yeah. Sigma i goes from 1 to capital N. Capital N, that's capital N plus 1 over 2. Over N. And one of the proofs that I don't like very much is due to seven year old Gauss that I'm sure you know. <laughs> <laughs> but if Gauss would have been really smart, he would have done the following define A of capital N like this. So this is. How Gauss should have been done if you were being really, really a genius. A of zero is zero. A of one is one. Zero. A empty, empty sum is zero. A of two is one plus two equals three. A of 
in this thing now. So it was not if this is uh, one times two. No, okay, one times. No, maybe that, okay. To be safe. And it works not as a pattern. This is one times two. This is zero times one over two. So, both sides are obviously polynomials of degree two. So to prove the polynomial of degree two is identically equal to zero is enough to check it in three different places. Yeah, so that's first a way for okay, you don't need that. That's the rigorous proof of the Pythagoras Gauss identity. So this is an example of the polynomial ansatz. In this case, n0 is very easy to find. It's just the degree plus one. But the other answer says, in which it's not so transparent. And by the way, we still torture our students in introduction to prove things to prove it rigorously, and if they just give you, say, it's two for uh, zero, one, and two, and even three, uh, you won't give them any credit. <laughs> Maybe if you're really nice, you give partial credit. <laughs> because you're stupid. <laughs> so the, the, the student who did it this way will, will have given a completely rigorous proof, also. <laughs> you may have not known it. Oh, you probably did not. Anyway, so the topic of today is already, it already came up, the Fabinacci number, and all the sequences that were either conjectural or proof to be piso sequences, is my favorite ansatz, the C finite ansatz. So this is the prototypical example of the Fabinacci. So we have a sequence of integers, that is integers, of, of numbers, so usually it's integers. So it's finally recurrent, but with constant coefficients. To the power n is also an example in the abstract. In this case, a of n plus 1, a of n minus 2 times a of n minus 1 equals 0. This is first order. This is second order, and the examples I had before were higher order, but this is a C finite answer. Even so, a priori, it's an infinite sequence, because you can go forever, conceptually and philosophically, it's only a finite object. All you need to know is a coefficient, a zero, a one, a two, so you can specify So the recurrence by the coefficients, so you can normalize it. So it's really a zero, a one, and a two. Okay. And of course, it's in these conditions. So a very good way to code it is that for the Fabinacci case, a zero one if you start at zero, comma one one, and that's a finite object. They can see the computer. Now it's elementary learners using very trivial linear algebra. So it's like the polynomials. This is an algebra. If you take any such object, the computer can store like this. The product and the sum and other operations are automatically like this. Also the difference, the sum and difference, if A of N is a solution of recurrence of order D1, and B of N is solution of recurrence of order two, a simple lemma using elementary linear algebra. The new sequence is a linear recurrence of order D1 plus D2. And the product is a product. If L of N recurrence of uh, order D1, so that's order, the new sequence is order D1 times D2. So it's an algebra, and the N0 is very trivial. So in every case, it's a routine thing for the computer, even in simple case for human, to prove it. That by finding the N0 and having completely rigorous proof. And about 10 years ago, the prestigious journal, Journal of Integer Sequences, published a six-page paper by one whose name I won't mention, 
Okay, but you can look it up in my paper. Z. Where is it? Yeah, here. Okay, I won't give you the also. <laughs> you can easily Google it and get it also. The title is Domino Tilings and Products of Fibonacci and Pearl Numbers. So now I've entered the sequences 2002. Six pages using human proofs. <laughs> but everything are identities of this type, the, the computer. And you go to my website, I have a paper called the Six Finance. And that you have lots of output. The computer proves it automatically in a few seconds. But this C finite ansatz is not only good for number theory or and or uh, and combinatorics and enumeration. Uh, three weeks ago, my brilliant collaborator, Manuel Carlos, talked about our joint work, how we did ab initio from scratch. Lars Onsager's famous derivation, the uh, famous formula for the so-called Ising model with magnetic field. Eh, no, with magnetic field, with zero magnetic field, apparently. The magnetic field is still wide open. So we had an approach, completely experimental mathematics. And from a purist, pure mathematician's point of view, it would have been only a conjecture. But from a theoretical physicist's point of view, it would have been completely valid. So if we had a computer, if we, Manuel and I, were alive in 1943, before once ago, well, 1944, and we had a computer, we probably would have gotten the Nobel Prize. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, we were born too late and didn't have a computer. So, <laughs> so our hope was to generalize our approach to prove it for non-zero. So, so far, and then we might get another prize if we do succeed. Unfortunately, we're not up to it yet. So, in the constellation prize, we wrote a beautiful paper. You can also download it from my website or from my archive. A, a simple derivation of Ontario's solution of the, the Ising model, and you can easily, uh, I recommend it, it's a very nice paper we wrote. And we had some quote unquote provocative remarks how it's so stupid, pure mathematicians, they get hung up about from a proof, and they will be completely valid proof. And the stupid, we have submitted to the American Mathematics Monthly, that's a natural, because it was uh, expository in a sense. And the stupid FRE said, this paper is a little bit interesting, but uh, it was a uh, but uh, not interesting enough for the monthly because it makes these stupid, uh, obnoxious comments that <laughs> I completely didn't give it. Luckily, the competitor was American Intelligentsia, they also had the same uh, exploratory nature. They grabbed it completely and it will appear soon, officially, in the American Intelligentsia. So, this is one approach which. I hope, uh, uh, how many of you go in Manuel's talk? Okay, so if not, it's in a video. I strongly recommend it, uh, I think. I think it's in the video? Yes, 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 yes. Okay, yes, yeah, so. Oh, no. oh, okay, not sure. Okay, okay, no. Anyway, you could get the paper. Uh, it's a very nice thing. But another approach that in another paper Emmanuel and I wrote was another way how Ontario could have discovered this. So first, Never mind the details, because I'm running out of time. You do it. So an Ising model is basically a combinatorial problem. You have a matrix M by N. Matrix of one and negative ones. So altogether, you have, obviously, the set of M by N matrices with negative one and one. So the naive counting, this is as easy. You don't get a number of price for this one. <laughs> so what also got was interested for in physics, uh, he had a good motivation, is a weighted counting. You have the weight of such a matrix, so you look at the product of nearest neighbors. So one minus one, one minus one, uh, one, one. So it's z to the power of sigma, aij, AI plus 1J, and for convenience, you made it into a torus. And plus 
So both vertical and horizontal neighbors. So it's a very simple definition. So I have some parameter z or variable, and instead of giving credit one, it gives this. Sum it up, and you have the weighted counting, some sequence. So if you, if you focus, so you define a polynomial. It's a Lorentz polynomial, because it's either, could be negative powers. P of n z is sigma z to the power the weight. So once again, if z is one, you back to the easy case. So what once again needed to do this seminal example of a phase transition derived theoretically, even though it's a toy model, when the big breakthrough was a theoretical a derivation of a phase transition in statistical physics. You take a log, you take a so-called thermodynamic limit. So you define a function, the limit as m and n go to infinity, and to prove, it's, to prove the limit exists is not very hard. I think function also get it. So you find a nice concrete function, and what also get it was find an explicit form. Very complicated. His proof is like using very uh, sophisticated and very complicated. So it's a nightmare. I don't know how many people did it. So in our paper with Manuel, we, we got a, a much more user friendly thing. Not rigorous, but very convincing. But this is one approach. The other approach is more similar to answer the original one is to do the finite case. So if you fix m and, and do f, f sub n, you have a function that only belongs, it depends uh, uh, on, on one parameter, m. So for m equals one, it's in, in every textbook. It's very easy, you can do it by hand. But with a computer, you can easily find uh, up to m equals 20 using the so-called transfer matrix. So it's a complete routine, Operation to regular symbolic combinations. So also I didn't have a computer, but if you did, you could have easily found. So it turns out that this guy's this sequence is M. But you freeze N, sorry, you freeze, you freeze M, the sequence of coefficients is in the C finite answers. Yeah. No, sorry, no, not quite. Uh, the sequence is, but uh, so this is an algebraic thing. Uh, but the generating function of this. And anyway, using this and our algorithm, it could have easily realized that this C finite sequence is a product of very simple C finite sequences of order two, probably like. So could, we could have easily, and we did it again, we reenacted it in the other paper with Manuel, also available from my website and Manuel's website and the archive, uh, could have empirically found this factorization into this. So this, you didn't have to be an also girl to conjecture the explicit thing that also girl did. He even did an explicit thing with this. I don't have time to remember. And then uh, he, he had the sum, and then when m goes to infinity, the sum becomes an integral, and he had this famous solution. Anyway, uh, there are two ways in which somebody could have gotten the Nobel Prize uh, with a computer before we could have gotten the Nobel Prize uh, way back. The one in our paper uh, in the intelligentsia, in the other paper uh, in, uh, in, in also in the archive using this. So uh, hopefully one day we can extend this approach to prove it for the Ising model with magnetic field. And then, uh, uh, and then uh, you have to pay me to come and talk. <laughs> <laughs> Before that, I'm very happy to talk for free. Thank you very much. <laughs> They need to guess this factorization. Uh, the, the factorization? Yes. Oh, not many. We have an algorithm. We have an algorithm, factorization algorithm. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't have to do it, uh, but uh, that uh, inputs uh, uh, inputs a uh, rational function equivalent here, recurrence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's input recurrent of all the four. And, and, and outputs, if they exist, 
And, and it's also very appropriate for the other seminar, the numerical symbolic interface. Because you can easily, if you have an algorithm, do it completely symbolically. But you can do it much faster numerically by, by cheating, by using floating point. So, so basically, the trick is very simple. So and let me just state if it's two by two case. So suppose you have a C finite recurrence. So you look at the characteristic polynomials, so you have the characteristic the root, lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3, lambda 4. So assuming that it's a product of, so remember, we have formula, a1 alpha 1n plus a2 alpha 2n times p1 beta 1n. Suppose you have two, so the computer can easily find it in floating points. So, if you have a hypothesis, it's really a linear combination of alpha 1 to so the rules. Alpha 1, beta 1, alpha 1, beta 2, alpha 2, beta 1, alpha 2, beta 1, alpha 2, beta 2. So, we are, and we can then write for m, m and n, m, m, m times n recurrence a question is a product of a C finite sequence of order m times a C finite sequence of order m. And in the case, it's two and two. So if it is, uh, if we hypothesize this, uh, the trick to do it, uh, we do a profile. We look at all the quotients of, if we have four random numbers, the number of quotients is uh, uh, four square by some of them are one. So it's 12. And usually, except for trivial things, they're not repeated. But here, alpha one, bet, alpha one beta one, or alpha one beta two, is beta one over beta two, and I, so this ratio. So you have some repetitions in the sequence, in the set of ratios. So we call it the profile. So when we have the accuracy, this is 50, can easily uh, numerically uh, find out whether it, it is. And if it follows the profile, uh, we have an indication it is. And then you can do symbolic combination to actually find the recurrence. And also in principle, since uh, the product thing is, if, if you want to do computer rigorous, uh, this operation of when you have a C finite representation, the so called Hadamard product, uh, is some algebraic expression. So it boils down to solving a system of non linear equation. You can use Grobner basis, although it's expensive, so cheating is much faster, <laughs> but in principle, you can do it. Thank you. Any questions? What can you say more about the N0? In your in your answers. Uh, in the C final answers? Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. In, in, in terms of uh, say two sequences being added or multiplied and sure, sure. Oh yeah, it's, it's algebra. It's a uh, you got more bit. Uh, uh, it's called the C final answers. Uh, but anyway, I will get to tell you briefly. No, the N zero in this case is just the order of the recurrence. That's like the polynomial in the degree. Uh, if you if you have if you know a priori that the sequence f of n satisfy some recurrence. Right. Okay. So if the initial conditions are this, so since you know the existing recurrence, you don't have to know right. the recurrence. So once it's zero, zero, zero. No. Uh, so the, yeah, so the, uh, so in polynomials, the the product of two polynomials, the d1 and d2, is d1 times d2, and the sum is a max d1 and d2. So something analogous is true here. Okay. Yeah, so using linear algebra, it's not too hard to prove that uh, if you have a recurrence of order d1 and a recurrence of order d2, mm -hmm. the sum is automatically a recurrence of, plus is a simple linear algebra algorithm to find the recurrence. And, but for, and for product, it's the product, I think. So that's why you can just by hand waving, and when you have some very complicated expansion with Fibonacci. Oh, for example, here's a homework point for you. Oh, yeah, okay, uh, let me be personal. Uh, uh, okay, I want to tell you, uh, my wife uh, had a birthday exactly a week ago. And uh, when anybody I know, my kids, and also other people, I have sent them a birthday greeting with numerical, with mathematical. Why this number is mathematically special? <laughs> so, in this case, I want uh, she kill me if uh, she kill me, but I think it's safe, uh, even though she loves me, she actually never watches the videos, so it's safe. <laughs> so, say, it's not a great number, 
because 5 times 14 is your age minus a square is 1. And this reminds of the famous Cassini identity, one of my favorite ones, due to the 18th century mathematician and astronomer. I think he had a comment or something in that video. That equation is the, uh, is the missing square. Right, right, that's, that's a, right, that's exactly. The square. Yeah, and the five famous paradox that one equals zero, uh, <laughs> uh, and hence the corollary, everything equals zero. Uh, and you have this, uh, yeah, this, uh, well, yeah. Uh, okay, you know this. Yeah. So the naked eye, it looks like, so like a tangram, you reassemble it. So that's behind it. Uh, anyway, uh, prove it. And not clap away! I mean, very disappointed we do the clever way. Like this news, for example. You see. I don't like this proof. Too clever for my taste. So you, you make the account into many sets. That's one of the many proofs. It's a long line. Or oh, hence, uh, hence, this is 0, 1, 1, 0 to the power n. So the determinant. Is negative one to the power n. I don't like this proof and the other proof. My favorite is check it for n equals zero, n equals one, n equals two, and to be safe, n equals three. <laughs> Pure D! It's true. Okay, let me see exactly how to make it equals. And that's a good uh, example. Uh, a priori, the product of this and this is order four. Mm -hmm. And this is. Also, order four. four. So four minus four is eight. And this is order one. So it's really order nine. So to make it rigorous, you have to check it up to the nine. Okay. But this is a big, big waste. And this is a more specialized theorem. Since this satisfies the same recurrences, uh, and this, this is order three. And since obviously the, this satisfies the same third order recurrence this, it's really order three. And that's order one, because a of n plus one plus a of n equals. Uh, zero, so c plus one is four, so four, proving it for n equals zero, one, two, and three, is a completely rigorous proof. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Okay, thank you. Thank you.